it was great to hear all of you tell me that there was a lot of human services and psych and counseling and stuff. It's great to hear that this generation, your cohort is really looking at those things. The need for that increases exponentially every year. Um, you will never be without a job. People will be begging for you to come work for them. Um, so it's a great, it's a great plan. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have a degree in social work from Barton College. Um, I'm local to North Carolina, but I've lived all over the country and I worked in the UK for a couple of years, um, all with um, kind of what we would call DSS services here, but it's, it's kind of different in other countries. So that's a bit, um, you can't really say it's the same. We um, started something here and I was working in a senior center. I was the director there and we started a grandparents raising grandchildren program. And at that point we were looking at things like grandparents that suddenly had their grandchildren. This was during a time when unemployment was high and a lot of people were joining the service because we were um, doing a lot of things overseas um, military wise. And they were leaving their children with their grandparents. And we were kind of looking at, oh, let's get the rooms fixed up. Let's get these kids to camp. Let's get the parents hooked the grandparents hooked up with technology and all these kinds of things. We weren't looking so much at what this was doing to the grandparents' lives. Um, and that's kind of the switch that's come about now. So yesterday I was on a conference with the federal government about how we switch that up. So it's constantly evolving everything we do with older people. Um, you know that we are an aging nation. I'm one of those okay boomer people. Um, so I know where that's coming from. Um, the number of people that are turning 65 in this country every day and the people that have health problems and mental health problems and all of that. In addition to that, people with developmental disabilities are living longer, happier, better, more productive lives, but they're gonna need our help throughout their lives. Um, so we have a lot of people that come to the center that are not your typical 70 year old with dementia, um, that's a misnomer about what we do, I think, out in the community. So um, with that, I think we'll just get started, if it's okay with you guys. So we are Friendship Adult Day Services. Um, our motto, I guess, or our mission statement is building friendships, keeping families together. We're a structured day program for impaired adults and their caregivers, I tell people that 50% of what I do is for the people who come to us every day to have a good time. The other 50% is for the caregivers that are at home, either taking care of themselves, taking care of others, working, whatever they need to do. Uh, we do adults 18 and over with a variety of reasons that they're there. They can be physical disabilities, developmental, mental health issues, mild to moderate, um, and cognitive concerns, including all forms of dementia. Um, a lot of people, when they think dementia, they think Alzheimer's, but dementia is the umbrella for that. Um, and there's, there's, I think, nine identified or 10 identified different types of dementia, and then some that have multiple issues. We provide daily supervision, socialization, and activities. And currently, right now, my youngest participant is 24. And the two oldest, who happen to be twins, are 92. Okay, everything, I lost everything. Okay, let's hold on, go back. Give it a minute, folks. Okay, let's get out of that and let's go back to this one. There it is. Okay, here we go. That slide that you see there on this one, the picture that's on this slide, that's our horticulturist and one of our participants. We have a huge back deck and we do lots of um, planting and pruning and we grow vegetables every year. They go out and they pick them, they take care of them. And those are raised beds because we have people in wheelchairs that can't get um, you can't stand up and do things. So they're all raised so people can go right up to them. 
We offer a stimulating day that provides aging in place while preventing isolation and related health problems that can result from lack of community connections and support. Um, aging in place has been proven to be uh, beneficial to people's um, physical and mental health. We know that people thrive better in their natural surroundings with their families, um, much better than they do in institutional care. Okay, we were founded in 1981 by a local caregiver who saw the need for day programming for vulnerable adults and relief for their caregivers. And she started it in her home um, and it got so popular that she went to a ch her church, I think, and asked if she could use some of their rooms and they did that. And then it got bigger than that. And then she got licensed because she had more than five people a day and it just blossomed from there. Um, so it began as a partial day program, sort of like a drop-in service. I need to go to the grocery store. Can mama stay with you? Or can dad hang out with you this afternoon? I need to do some gardening work and he's not um, safe to be in the house alone while I'm doing it. And then it just blossomed into full daycare. We evolved into a full program. We're person-centered, supportive service and long-term care. Um, I need to move my picture, there we go. Um, improving quality of life for the elderly and or disabled population. So person-centered just means that everybody that comes in, we do a complete workup on every participant that, that tries to enroll. We make sure that we can fill their needs, they meet our criteria, and we learn enough about them to kind of make the program fit what they need. It's not one size fits all, definitely. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for residents in the community through socialization and stimulation as an alternative to living alone or in institutional care. We've already talked about why that's so important. Um, a little bit about this little lady that's sitting here in the turquoise sweater. She is my only female veteran that we've ever had. And when I met this woman and I'm doing that canvassing and trying to find out who she is and where she comes from and what we can do for her, one of the things we talk about is their careers, their work life. And so she told me, you know, her daughter's very proud of her. Um, she's a uh, Army veteran, this, that, and the other. So I asked her, I said, well, can you tell me what you did? And she looked at me just as serious. And she said, honey, I could tell you what I did, but they said I'd have to kill you after that. So she worked at what was called the Annex in Washington, D.C., coding and decoding messages during World War II. She was a qualifier and we had the most wonderful time with this lady. Okay, our program goals remain the same as they were from the first day we opened. Um, it's to enhance participants' quality of life through varied and age-appropriate activities designed to support independence, security, self-worth, and aging in place. Like I said, my youngest is 24, my oldest are 92. What they like to do, what they're used to doing, it's all kind of different. So it's like I said, it's not one size fits all. It's we kind of have to pattern our um, activities and everything so that we're very inclusive of all the age groups. So some days we have people that don't like the music we're playing and some days we do. And some days they don't want to do this activity. It's, it's maybe they think it's too childish. So we are constantly having to revamp what we do based on the population we're serving. Because people, tend to come and go. Um, the younger people tend to stay longer. I've got a young man that's been there for nine years now, but I've got one older person that's been there for nine years too, but the others tend to come and go depending on their um, ability to still participate. That's one of our levels that we have to look at. So some people move, some people um, unfortunately pass away. You know, some people have to go into care because they can't be contained at home anymore. Um, we also reduce participants' isolation that may lead to depression, poor nutrition, and risk of injury. People who live alone don't tend to eat as well as others, even if somebody's going by or making food and leaving it for them. Um, eating alone is not something that people tend to like to do. It's a socialization, especially in our country, and um, people tend just not to eat. Plus, people with dementia don't get hungry. They don't feel that hunger sometimes. So they just don't eat. Um, so we do a lot around nutrition and exercise and fall prevention and things like that. 
We increased educational and support group services for caregivers in Alamance County. I talked about that. We do a lot of support groups. We do a lot of counseling there. We do a lot of referrals to other agencies that offer other resources in the community. And I want to take this moment right now to tell you that you're in an amazing community. Like I told you, I've worked all over the United States and I've worked in a foreign country. I've worked all over North Carolina and I've worked with a bunch of really great people who got what I did and why I did it and were very passionate about what they did. But I have never worked in a community that rallied together and supported the people in need like Alamance County does. And I tell that to everybody new that comes in, everybody that gets hired into this group of folks that we work with. We are very connected. The resources are very connected. Um, and we're very helpful trying to make people make sure people get connected to those resources. There's none of the um, um, oh, I do that so I can't tell you about this other place. There's none of that in Alamance County. It's an amazing place to live and work. We continue to meet the financial burden associated with transporting the elderly or disabled to and from daycare. We did not get any funds per se for our department. Um, but what we do have is funding from other people, the EDTAP money, which is elderly and disabled um, transportation money from the federal government. ACTA and um, some of the other places here get that money and they set aside portions of it for us. We work very closely with them because a lot of our people, even if they live with somebody, um, that person doesn't drive either. Transportation is an issue in North Carolina and other parts of the country because of the rural nature of a lot of our, our um, folks. So that's always something that's in the forefront when we talk with people. We try, if they can transport themselves or have someone transport, then we do. But if they can't, then we work very closely with these other agencies to make sure they can get to the services they need. Because it does no good to offer it if they can't get there. We also expand services in order to meet the growing need in the county. We are part of the assessment needs um, that's done every two years, three years here. Um, part of the census, um, we've been helping promote the census and making sure that all of our folks entered all their information. That's how federal dollars flow and state dollars flow to communities and states. Um, so we have to make sure that everybody does that. Um, and we also try to expand services based on needs from those needs assessments. If we see that there's an uptick in a certain population, then we try to see who can cover that and who can best serve that population. And I, do y'all have access to the chat? Um, if you do, if you come up with a question that while I'm talking, if you want to put it out on chat, um, of course, you guys are younger, so you can probably remember it. If it was me, if I didn't write it down, it would have never happened. Population that we serve are caregivers, like I said. Um, they're unsure about what to do for someone who's forgetting more frequently or someone who is unable to complete skills of daily living, like taking their own bath or brushing their own teeth, fixing their hair, getting dressed, um, cooking for themselves, things like that. Um, some of our caregivers work during the day. About 60% of my caregivers right now have a job. So they're worried about the safety of that older person that they're leaving at home, um, falls, things like that, people coming to the door that you shouldn't let in, people calling you and asking you for personal information. There are all kinds of things that can make it unsafe for someone to be home alone. Um, they need time for themselves to better care for their loved ones. Um, that's something that we stress with our caregivers. We do a dementia series. Um, every spring, we're not doing it this year because of COVID-19, but we do a dementia series that goes from beginning to end. And one of the things we stress throughout the entire thing is that they take care of themselves because they literally cannot take care of someone else if they don't. Um, caregiving is very stressful um, to say that um, my mother took care of me when I was a baby, so I'm going to take care of her now. Or my dad was always there for me, so I'm going to be there for him now. It's different. Children grow up and become independent. Older people with dementia go the other way. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. So it's very different. And to respect that and to have them be able to say, this is hard, is, is mind blowing for them sometimes. So it's very important that we stress that with them. 
want to find the best possible care for their loved one to keep them home as long as possible. And we talked about that. The best nursing home in the world is a horrible place for anyone to have to live because it's not personal. It's not your family. They can give you great care and they can love you. I know lots of people who work in nursing homes that really love their, their um, participants and their clients, but it's not the same as being with your family. It never is. Um, so living at home, being as independent as possible, um, having people take care of you and work with you that you love and trust is a huge part of growing older and doing it in a way that's um, more conducive to your health and your well-being. So those are our participants in this picture, and they are all dressed up for Halloween. We're big on Halloween. I think it's because I'm big on Halloween, but it's probably my, one of my favorite um, holidays of the year because you just kind of get to be somebody else or something else. And half of those people are people that work with us. Um, half of those people are participants, and it's kind of hard to tell the difference <laughs> if you look at them. Um, but they have a great time, and we have uh, costume contests for the best dressed woman, man, best dressed overall. Um, we do all kinds of games that they can win stuff and prizes at. They all come dressed up. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. They wait for it every year. So populations that we serve, we do serve folks who reside in group homes or assisted living facilities and would like to get out into the community. However, I need to mention this, that would all be private pay because if they're already living in a facility that is supposed to be providing them with activities, the federal government will not let us use any of our grant money for reimbursement for their coming. But we do have people who live in assisted living facilities. We've had people who've come from um, Twin Lakes and uh, the village of Brookwood and places like that that can actually still get out of their families, go and get them. Or we've had some vans bring them and drop them off just a day a week just to get out of where they're living. Um, but that has to be private pay. Some live home alone and would benefit from socialization with peers. We have a couple of folks who live alone. They're still able to get out and do things, but they can't drive anymore or they don't have transportation. Some live with family members, but the family members work. So they are left home alone to their own devices. And like I said, that's not a good idea for a lot of our folks. Um, or they have memory loss and confusion and they need a structured environment. Um, Lots of people who have some form of dementia and start losing that ability to remember short-term memory usually. They can tell you things they did when they were five, but they can't tell you what they had for lunch two hours ago. Um, it's that simple and that hard. Um, so telling them and giving them instructions and helping them do something, and then five minutes later you have to do the same thing again, just like it's the first time because for them it is the first time. Uh, so that's really, that's um, something that a lot of caregivers aren't trained to do, and it becomes very frustrating. So we spend a lot of time working with them when these things come up. And as we start to notice stuff, we also call the, the participants caregivers, and we find out if that's happening at home so that we can kind of tell them how things they can do to deal with that. So we provide a friendly, safe environment social therapeutic and recreational programming, as well as um, most of our social stuff and our therapeutic stuff is what they call psychosocial. So there's a, a reason behind what we're doing more than just the end product. For instance, when we're doing crafts, there's dexterity and manual labor and things like that involved in it that help them keep those abilities to do those things. Uh, we serve a nutritional hot lunch and two healthy snacks a day. A lot of our folks get up at 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, get dressed, get some breakfast because they have to take medications, and then by 10 o'clock they're starving to death. So about 9 o'clock we serve a little small snack. We do the same thing in the afternoon. We call it our coffee hour. Um, and so about 2 o'clock we'll do another little snack. Um, they're light snacks. They're things like yogurt and raisins or a piece of cheese toast or cinnamon toast in the morning, uh, half a bagel, things like that. 
We do monthly outings uh, when we can. As I said, transportation money has dried up in North Carolina for things like that. It's mostly for medical needs or to come to places like ours um, or to go grocery shopping. There's a few things that, that will take them grocery shopping. Um, but those kinds, of out, those kinds of monthly outings have kind of dried up. We don't go out as much anymore. We used to go to the ball games. We took them to see the Royals play. We used to take them across the street to the restaurant and have lunch once a month, things like that. But we tend to just do things in indoors now more um, in, in the facility. Daily exercise programs. We exercise twice a day. I know y'all have all heard move it or lose it. And it's true. And as you get older, if you don't use those muscles, they tend to atrophy actually. It's almost like having to go through physical therapy to get them working again. Um, if you've been in a hospital for any length of time, you know when you come out, you have to work back up to what you can do. So keeping people moving, and we do it to music. In the mornings we walk, um, and it's to music. Even the people in wheelchairs get taken around. If they can't roll themselves, we take them around. People on walkers and canes and things like that. Everybody gets up and moves. Um, and then in the afternoons, after that two o'clock snack is cleaned up, we do what's called chair exercises and fall prevention. So most everything can be done from your chair, or if you can stand, we have you stand. Uh, but it's to move every part of your body from your neck. You, we start with the neck and move all the way down to your toes. So you're moving everything to the best of your ability, and everybody's taught to do that. Don't push yourself. We're not trying to build muscles. We're just trying to keep the ones you have working. Supervision of uh, and administration of medications. Um, we can take folks who have oral or topical medications. We're not allowed to give shots or do any kind of feeding tubes or anything like that that's considered medical because we are a social day program. Uh, so we can, if your, pers if your um, loved one takes medications at lunch, then we've got two med techs and we're very structured as to how we do that and how we account for it and all of that. And then encouragement with social, physical, and emotional well-being. That's the whole person, and that's what we're here for, is the whole person. We're not here to just address one specific item. It's a holistic approach. It's the whole person that um, we're looking at. So social interactions with their peers, they make fast friends. Um, they have a lot of our folks see each other outside now. Uh, their families get them together. The two twins I mentioned, they grew up as twins, very close. Um, one of them never drove, the other one did. While she was driving, she would pick the other one up. They would go to lunches, they would go shopping together. When she stopped driving, all of that stopped because everybody's caregivers, the people they were living with or taking care of them worked. So there was nobody to do that with them. So they got together occasionally for family gatherings or something like that. But all of their closeness was just destroyed when that person lost her driver's license. So when we had one of them with us for several years, and I knew she had a twin, but I didn't realize she lived in the community. And when we found out she did, we reached out to them and we said, I have funding for your mother to come here and she can spend the day with her sister. She now comes three days a week and it's amazing to watch them get together. We talked about the physical and the emotional well-being. Being alone, and, and everybody now knows this, I'm hoping because of the isolation and the stay-at-home orders and all of that, being alone is great if you're that person who loves it. And, and I'm kind of half and half. I like my me time, but I like, I'm social too. I like other people. So being um, out of that and not being able to see people and socialize and, you know, go to your lunches or play cards with your friends or go to the theater, all of that takes a toll on people. So we try to make sure we do that. We're licensed by the state of North Carolina as an adult daycare facility, and we are a social day model, not a medical model. So we don't take Medicaid or Medicare. We don't get any of that kind of money. But we conduct annual surveys with our participants to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our families and offering the best possible care. We are required to do that. We would do it anyway. Um, there's no way to offer a program to this many people with these, these different cultures and backgrounds 
and not ask them what they want. It's very person-centered. We're very much, what do you need and how can we give it to you? We're also accountable programmatically and financially to all of our funding sources, and we undergo a financial audit every year. Um, we have an outside um, bookkeeping service that does our bookkeeping and stuff, and we do an audit every year. So these are some of our funding sources. The Federal Home and Community Block Grant, it's um, HDCBC, um, that's from the Older Americans Act, and it just got reauthorized this year um, and for five years, and we've got finally gotten an increase. Um, we're getting an increase every year for the next five years. They're planning that out over that um, because the need has increased so much since the money has. And we're very good about showing that need through our community assessments and the census and things like that. Family caregiver support program, that's strictly for caregivers. That's what funds our um, resource fairs that like elder care does in the community for um, folks and for caregivers. Um, it funds some respite services. It funds our dementia series. It funds advertising for us to let people know we're there. We can order pamphlets for our caregivers, and we can do our brochures and things like that. The elderly and disabled transportation, that was the EDTAP money for transportation that I talked about. ACTA gets that in our area and a couple of other places. You have to be a transportation entity now to get that, but they are, work very closely with us to make sure a, a part of that pot of money goes for us. Private pay participants, that varies depending on who comes in and who needs to come in, whether we have funding at the time, whether they are able to pay. Um, caregiver contributions, when a person comes in and goes on home and community care block grant that is not at or below the poverty level, we have to tell them, uh, there's a formula that we have to use to tell them, you don't have to give me anything, but this is what, according to your income and the federal government, this is what you should be able to contribute. Some people do every month and some people don't and some people just can't because it doesn't take into account any other types of um, bills that people have. So we get, um, I think I wrote down, about, I'll tell y'all later how much we get from all of these. Caregiver contributions, community donations. Um, for instance, the Burlington Women's Club, they run a thrift shop downtown and we get a contribution from them every quarter. Um, part of the, and we send our folks down there to buy things. So all of our participants know that it's there and the caregivers. Um, so it's a, it's a win-win. We help them, they help us. And fundraising efforts. We've had a several fundraising. We work with the young musicians of Alamance County. Um, we had a band that one of our members' husbands was in that opened up at a, a place downtown for us one night and we got all of the, um, the take from that night. Um, so we do fundraisers as we need to. Um, we also sell cards. Our folks do a big art project and they all of their art is framed and they can take it home or we sell it. And then we also make cards out of it. So we sell the cards there um, and at some other places in town. So that's me, that's us, that's where we are. This is, <laughs> this is one of my volunteers in this picture. Um, and she will do, as you can see, anything. So the balloon lady, she came dressed as the balloon lady. And the balloon lady actually showed up that day. There's a woman that goes around and does, you know, they make all these animals and different figures out of balloons that you twist up. So they all showed up together. So we had the balloon ladies that day. It was pretty funny. So I guess I can, let me, let me give you a little bit of information about our budget that's not in here. I wanted to tell you that. So those funding sources, let's go back to those for a second. Um, for Home and Community Care Block Grant, and this is just what my budget was last year. It's ever-changing. A budget is a fluid thing. Just remember that. Um, about $183,000 came from Home and Community Care Block Grants. About $2,000 came from Family Caregiver Support. Um, we also have another one that's not listed. Oh, yeah, it's a Child and Adult Care Program, CAC, NC Cares. Um, that's a program, it's similar to the, it's the same program basically for school children that get free and reduced lunches. Um, we get about $15,000 a year from that to help pay for our food. Um, the other money comes through ACTA. Alamance County Department of Social Services, their CAP program, 
a lot of our folks who are developmentally disabled or who are fall risk at home um, and qualify for Department of Social Services funding, we get about $60,000 a year from them. Private pay usually runs around 7,500. Caregiver contributions, about 2,000. Community donations, about 1,000. And then the fundraising is as needed. Um, in addition to that, the big part of this is Home Community Care Block Grant is the only one that has a match requirement. When you get grants, sometimes you have to provide a certain, you, you tell them I need $200,000 to run this program, but you have to do a $20,000 match or something like that, or, or $2,000 match or whatever. Um, our match is in kind. Um, we're allowed to do in kind, which means it doesn't have to be a monetary match. It can be services that are are things that are donated to you free of charge. We do over 2,000 volunteer hours a year at Friendship between the Elon students that come, community people that come, the Burlington Women's Club who come and does an activity every um, month and all of that. So those hours are used. We don't have to come up with any monetary match to get that home and community care block rent because we have way more than the 10% match just in our um, volunteer hours. Hours, that's set by the federal government every year. They tell you how much a volunteer is worth an hour to your company. Um, and they do that through a lot of different ways. But um, we can use that dollar amount to meet our match. So we don't have to come up with that. Um, so my budget runs somewhere around $270,000, $275,000 a year. And like I said, that's adjustable. Um, now I just want to talk about the people that we serve. There's a breakdown on that too. 20% um, of the folks that we serve are at or below the poverty levels. I mean, 20 of the people, we have 28 right now. 20 of them are below the poverty level. So that's about 71%. Um, African-American, we have 18%. White is 75%. Hispanic is 3.5. And we have one gentleman from Barbados. He's considered Pacific Islander. So that's one point, that's 3.5. We've had a hard time recruiting people from the Hispanic community. We've had a few people, but the problem is there's two things we are dealing with. One is that they tend to stay home and keep their folks home with them. They're very family oriented and family centric. So also having them come there, even if they've been here for a long time, English is still their second language. And unfortunately, it becomes one of those short-term memory issues. They tend to start losing the ability to speak in English or understand us. And we don't have anybody right now that works in my facility that's fluent in, his, in Spanish. So that's one of the things that we're always looking at when I'm hiring new people. I'm always trying to look for someone who's fluent in Spanish so that we can build up that population a little better. 10 are male. 30 and 18 are female. When I came to Friendship almost nine years ago, there were two males there. Men tend not to come. They just don't want to. Um, no, but, but a lot of times they don't. Men also tend to die earlier than women. Sorry, guys. Um, my friend has a theory about that. He says they die because they can. Um, but it's um, harder for men to come. Women are caregivers and they understand it and they're welcome and they're more, a lot of times they're more social than men. So we had to revamp our program to make it more appealing to men, and that's what we did. And so we've increased our numbers every year. Also, when I came to Friendship, we had 14 participants, exactly half of what we have now. Um, and they didn't all come every day. So right now we're doing about, um, I'm trying to think, we're doing about 3,500, about 350 hours a month now versus what we were doing when I came, which was less than 100. Uh, 11 of those people have dementia. Eight of them are developmentally disabled. One has a mental health issue. She has schizophrenia that's controlled by medication. And 11 have physical disabilities. Now, my math majors out there have just added that up and that came to 31, not 28. And that's because some people have multiple issues. So some of my people with physical disabilities also have dementia. When we talk about physical disabilities, we have people there with MS whose minds are sharp as a tack, but their bodies just won't do what they want it to anymore. We've had people that have had a stroke. We have people with heart disease. We have people with arthritis that's put them on a walker or a cane. And we have people in wheelchairs. So um, we have a very vast array of folks, 65 
17 are 65 and over, so about 61% of my population is over 65, and some of them well over 65. And we talked about the fact that they're, my youngest is 24 and my oldest two are 92 right now. So that's about all I have to say. I'll open it up for questions now or um, don't see anything on chat. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, um, this is uh, Dr. Monica. I just wanted to um, thank you for the presentation, and I would like to just highlight a few things before opening it up for a discussion of the things that you said. Okay. Um, so one is um, I, I really appreciate the comparison you did of the isolation that people under care or in care facilities may be uh, facing in the importance of, of uh, you know, doing this type of work of visiting and cheering them up and the type of things that Elon students can do on a regular basis because we got a glimpse of that isolation in mm -hmm. social distancing that can be experienced. So I think that now we have a very good sense of what that is and so we can develop a little bit more empathy for people who are in care facilities. The other point you made which I think is important and relevant to this class is the importance of the healthcare professions and this crisis has, has proven that and uh, you know um, that we have become uh, essential workers and um, so jobs in this field definitely will continue to be uh, important and available. So even in timing now has grown substantially nationwide. Um, uh, another point I wanted to make is about the collaboration across agencies and it was very um, affirming actually what you said about elements in the uh, collaboration that the different agencies have been doing to serve the needs of vulnerable populations through this type of crisis. So particularly older uh, populations and people with disabilities. So, uh, but other um, low income families and so forth, I guess, that um, uh, have continued to be served and um, um, they, the other point is the community support and the importance of the community support. Thanks for providing all of those details about the funding because that give us, give us an idea also of how critical the contribution that Elon um, is students in raising funds for um, a friendship adult services can actually be critical for um, the continuation of um, this type of services. And um, especially in, in times where, you know, some funding, government funding may be available, but that's not uh, the case uh, regularly. Um, and then the last point is um, I thank you for providing, actually, for my students a wonderful model of a presentation for a, a, the agency profile which is actually one of the assignments that the students will be choosing from um, because we have, I have done some modifications to it, but it's one of the assignments that are, um, students are considering to do um, about their placements in terms of presenting the information, the services provided, the population served, and um, the, all of the funding issues as well. So um, I, lastly, I just want to say um, about the Latino community that you mentioned and Latinx community, there is uh, a lot of uh, definitely need for services, bilingual services, not just the Spanish and English, but other type of, other type of languages. And so it's a way of encouraging also students especially who are going into this field that you can get uh, um, 
you know, you increase your chances when you have a second language, actually, of employment at entry. And uh, in some locations, like um, right now in Maryland and in uh, the Northern Virginia area, for example, uh, where there's a large community population, jobs here are available, but that's almost a requirement, actually, to be able to get a job because the, um, it, the, the ethnicity of the population here in this area is very diverse. My mom is in Chicago and it's been taken care of by my sister full time oh. because she's a stay home mom. And so, and we support a distance, but I understand what you said about, you know, sort of wanting to keep um, our, um, a, our older, um, members of the family actually at home and uh, it's, it's not only it's very traditional but I think uh, was part of the culture Absolutely. but I've been actually you know always promoting that uh, um, that can result also in greater isolation and uh, because there's no contact with other people and uh, and there have been cases also, not just in the Latino community, but in other communities where um, all the older members of the family stay at home that could, could, could uh, turn into, you know, adult abuses or, or the need for adult abuse services. So uh, it's important to, to um, learn how uh, a, we need to provide culturally sensitive uh, services as well. Thank you. I love it while you're talking, they're, they're sending out chats and then they're answering each other's questions. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Um, yeah, one of the things I, you touched on that I, I didn't, and I will tell you this, during this time of, of the stay at home orders and the isolation, we know as a community that several things will probably be on the rise. Spousal abuse, drug and alcohol use, elder abuse, and child abuse. Unfortunately, those things will not only be on the rise because of what being isolated does to all of us mentally, if we kind of let it, you know, it can really wear on you and cause you maybe to do things or be short tempered when you wouldn't be before or just do things to escape it. But also because it doesn't give the person who's being abused, whatever age group they are, the ability to ask for help because they are there with the abuser all the time. So that's one of the things that we jumped into right away with our our participants, the people at the Family Abuse Center, all of that um, DSS. We the monitoring and the talking to folks every day and trying to pick up on those little things that are going on or something that we're all having to do right now. Unfortunately, um, let's talk to uh, Juliana. Asked me, how did you decide you wanted to work in this field? Well, it probably wasn't just one thing, but um, I've had two careers. The first half of my life, I was a cost accountant for major cosmetics companies um, and an international coordinator for them, coordinating all their international sales and services. Um, and I did that very well. Um, I became a single parent when my child was three years old and I had to support him. And the day that I wrote the last check for his college education, I wrote the first check for mine. I went back to school. Um, I had gotten degrees from uh, community colleges in accounting and business administration and computer science and stuff like that. It helped me in the job I had, but I always wanted to work with people. I'd always been a people person. I was a kid in the neighborhood who handed out the band-aids, okay? I was the kid in the neighborhood who, who fixed lunch for the kid down the street whose mother was working. You know, those kinds of things. So I always knew I wanted to work with people. I had a very rich upbringing. I had lots of great grandparents and grandparents around me all the time. So I was very um, involved with um, older people, their stories, care for them, all that kind of stuff. When I went to Barton, where I have my degree, um, I needed one more class to make up my first. I went on a trimester system. I worked full time while I went back to college. Um, I did what's called lifelong learning. Uh, so I went three trimesters a year versus two semesters. Um, and I went on Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday. 
every weekend for two years of my life. So, and it was well worth it. Um, but I needed one more class. And the only thing that was open that I was even vaguely interested in was Gerontology 101. I took that class from Dr. Stephen Folks at Barton and I was hooked for life. Um, working with older people and working with people with disabilities, their need is so great that quite um, the give back and the satisfaction you get from doing what you do is instant almost every day. So that feel good. The reason we do most things we do is because they either make us feel good or make us feel better or that that's the things that we stay. We do all the other stuff because we have to. But the things we really love are the things that make us feel better about ourselves and humanity and all of that. And I was just hooked after that one class. So that's where I went. I did a heavy concentration in gerontology while I was there. Um, when I worked overseas, I went over to do the grandparents raising grandchildren program that I was doing here. And I worked with other people as well, but mostly adults and their children and grandchildren. Um, it's just very rewarding. And the old saying, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life is so true. Um, I'm 64 years old. I have no retirement age even picked out as long as I can do this and I'm healthy and it's making a difference and this is what I'll be. So that's why I got into this field, I guess. Um, around what time do adults begin their day? We're open from seven to five every day. Um, some people drop them off at seven. We have three or four that come in that early. Um, they normally get picked up a little earlier, but the folks have to go to work, so they drop them off. The majority of our people come in between 8.30 and 9 and get picked up anywhere from 3 to 4. We require that they are there at least six hours in order to receive funding. Um, and if they can't make a day, they have specific days they come. We're not a drop-in center. So if they come Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we ask them to try to make their doctor's appointments on Tuesdays and Thursdays when they're not there, but that's not always possible. So we try to work with them. If they give us enough um, advance notice, we can work with them so they can come a different day so they don't actually miss a day. Um, the next question was how many people? Um, it's 71% at or below the poverty line. So some of those people are right at the poverty line and some of them are, are below that. Um, how are you still connecting? Okay, um, in order for me to continue receiving funding from those programs that I talked about, we still had to connect with our folks. I go in every day and I call every single one of our participants and caregivers every day. The majority of them really enjoy it because what we're doing is we're checking in with them to make sure everything's okay. We're giving them a sounding board if they're the caregiver or the participant. If things aren't going well, um, we can give them some ideas and suggestions. We knew this was coming, so two weeks before we shut down, we um, sent out letters, we sent out information and materials and things to the families. We started getting them ready for what we knew was coming. Um, so that's kind of working out. We do referrals, um, and sometimes I just listen. Sometimes we just talk. We've got one young lady who um, is developmentally disabled, and one of her um, ongoing issues is that she can get stuck on a conversation on a topic and she just can't seem to break away from it. She'll ask you not the same question over and over again, but just the same thing. She just wants to talk about the same thing. And so that's really trying on the family right now because they're, she's there all day and they're not used to that. Um, so I spend, I call her last and I spend about 15 or 20 minutes on the phone and we talk about whatever she wants to. So it helps the family out, it helps her out, it lets her get all that out. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, given that social distancing is going to be important after quarantine or the stay at home orders lifted, how would that affect your services? Would you decrease the amount of participants who can do certain activities or be in the same room at the same time? That's one of the things that we've been looking at. We will probably, unfortunately, be one of the last places that can open up. The reason being, with that many of my folks having dementia, and us being Southerners and living in the South, and all we do is hug on folks and kiss on folks, and um, we're very sharing, and we want to be right there with everybody. It's really hard to keep that social distancing. Um, and I don't, I do this uh, very rarely, but I will take this back to and do it kind of as a analogy with children. Children don't understand about washing their hands when they come out of the bathroom. You have to constantly tell little kids, no, you need to wash your hands. Um, and they think, 
in their little minds, they think, oh, well, it won't matter if I don't watch it this time. One time's not going to hurt. But unfortunately, in this case, one time will hurt. So it's, it's very hard for us to operate with people who can't remember what you just told them five minutes ago um, and keep them safe. So we are looking at ways that we might be able to do that. The, the problem people have, and this is something that I don't see people thinking about, um, is that you can keep people in separate rooms, but they're all going to use the same bathrooms. Um, they're all going to go at different times, and it's going to be constant. It is all day with us. Somebody's in the bathroom all the time. When you have, I think our highest day is 23 people in one day. Um, there's somebody in the bathroom and six staff people. So you've got 30 people in a room, and we've got three bathrooms. Um, so they're going to be in and out. And and the time it would take to go in and sanitize that and make sure you catch that every time and clean that entire bathroom down would be impossible with what we do. So we're we're now strategizing and trying to figure out ways that we can reopen when it's safe to do so. Um, with the orders that were extended yesterday, it's been extended to May 8th. I think you will see it go further than that because we had our first death in Alamance County yesterday. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but it's the first death from COVID was yesterday. Um, it was an older person who had many underlying um, issues, um, but that's about all we know. And it's probably all we should know, actually. Um, we stayed open until we had our first case. The first case was the 19th of March, I believe, and we heard about it the next morning on the 20th. That was a Friday, and that was the last day we were in operation. Um, our folks come first. Their safety comes first. So if we can figure out a way to bring them back, we will. Um, and we're hoping that, that we can do something like that. We just don't have the area. Um, we have two areas um, that we could have activities in. We could keep people... We could probably maybe keep 10 people a day, six feet apart, but um, trying all the logistics of giving them their medicines and feeding them and keeping them out of the bathrooms, you know, right behind each other and stuff like that is going to be something we're really going to have to look at. And we are starting to look at that now. I, I want to mention this. I mentioned it to Carmen before we started. I got the newsletter from Elon yesterday. And in the e Elon newsletter, there was a listing apparently there are around 49, I think, I can't remember the exact number, um, students that are living here in the United States because they can't go home to their home countries. Um, and I wanted to extend an invitation if there's some way we can work that out to where while we're closed and you need to be doing hours and things, if you could come to Friendship maybe just one at a time. Uh, or two at a time in a different car or whatever we need to do for social distancing. I don't know how y'all are doing that at Elon, if if you're still having to share rooms and things like that, I don't know. But but if there's some way y'all could come and spend a day with me um, while I'm working and see what I do, and I'll talk to you about our funding in more depth and our grant writing and what we do there and let you see the activities we do and stuff like that. Um, that's something I'd like to do if it's possible. And if not, if they just want to give out my phone number, um, I lived and worked in England for two years, and I told Carmen that um, Skype and phone calls went just so far. You still miss your family, and you miss that connection, um, and you miss your grandma. And I could be your grandma. That's fine. I don't care. But just somebody else to talk to um, or somebody else to run things by or somebody else just who understands what it feels like to be away from home. So um, that's something that I've extended to them and uh, just want to make sure that y'all knew about it in case somebody wanted to take us up on that. That'd be fine. Are there any more questions? Did I not answer something somebody wanted to ask me? I didn't miss anything. I so enjoyed this. I just want to tell y'all that. Um, I've been on many virtual meetings um, these last five weeks or so. Um, and I quite frankly like them because nobody has to travel. Nobody has to pay for people to travel. And we all still get to talk to each other and ask questions. So um, I'm all for this. I love 
the telemarketing stuff, like for, for our business and stuff. I mean, I'm telling you all about this. Y'all all know about me now. It didn't cost us anything to tell you about everything. Um, it may help you with when, what you decide what you want to do. Um, and, and understand that you can change your mind. That's the thing most people need to understand. And I think a lot of kids go into college with, I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that. And something happens to you like it did to me. And you have that aha moment where this is really what I want to do. And I will tell you, getting into nonprofit work and things like this, you're never going to make a, a fortune. Um, we operate by the skin of our teeth most of the time, but we always manage to get it done. Um, but, and that's another thing I hope comes out of this, that money is not the most important thing in life. I think a lot of people were hung up on, I got to make a zillion dollars and I got to do this and I got to have that. Really, you don't. Um, what you've got to have is peace of mind and the knowledge that you've made a difference in this world when you do leave it, because we're all going. But um, being able to make a difference is so much more satisfying than anything I've ever purchased. Well, thank you again, Connie, for taking the time to meet with us. And if there's no more questions, I just would like to um, said my appreciation, and uh, I'm pretty sure that all of the students are also grateful for this conversation during this time. And uh, I just want to say that I posted the most uh, updated PowerPoint as well, and um, students were um, supposed to be taking notes and uh, a, about your presentation, and this will be submitted. Um, as well, please include just uh, if you want to communicate any um, words of appreciation to Connie as well, you can take the opportunity in those notes and I'll, I'll make sure that she gets them. Uh, thank you very much again for all of your time and thanks, Ted, for making this possible as well. All right, thanks, thanks Ted. Thanks, Carmen.